your city and what that could look like. So we're gonna start out with a uh, great video. When you are on your drive to work, every neighborhood you pass, every business you go by is full of people, people he knows. The whole world is working out their relationship with God. Whether they know it or not, they are dealing with the fact that they do not know him the way they desperately need. When the Lord shows up and makes himself known, he quickly calls us to a life of making him known to others. Your cities are filled with churches, businesses, and schools, with different tribes, nations, and tongues, with people who are hurting because they do not know, because they have not heard. The exact places you are called, the neighborhood, the church, the business, is the exact playing field the Lord has given for you to make disciples of Jesus. Thousands of years ago, that same Jesus was born, grew up, and sent out into cities and neighborhoods and towns on purpose, on mission. He set people free. He told people the truth. He brought with him the Lord's spirit, and they were different, changed, better. Love your city is a specific action. It's three words with directions. Love, extend outward, give generously, show his goodness to others the way it was revealed to you. Your, it's the place that only you can take. It's the one you are made for. It's the people you were called to. It's specifically for you because the Lord has sent you there. City, a place that is not one thing but many, a place on a map with a name, a place filled with small businesses and large companies, a place with different kinds of worship, a place where there are stores and schools and apartments and houses. No matter where it is, your city has people in it, people who need what he has. And so we go out to love our city. We go with the team, those who are called to the same mission, to the playing field to which we were sent. Some go to worn apartments in a dangerous part of town. Some go to the 24th floor of a tall, round, glass building. Some go to a classroom with colorful posters tacked over the cold cinder block walls. And we look for the Lord, for his softening of hearts, for his moments of opening, for his direction, of what it is we're there to do, for who it is we're there to love. Love Your City is the collective movement of one person after another, understanding that the everyday spaces and places of their life are the exact and specific places of ministry given for us to be with him in the redemption of others. Your address is on purpose. Your boss was picked for you. The grocery store clerk is not someone random. These are the people you were given to love. This is your mission. This is your chance. To be with him on his relentless mission, that no one would perish, and that they would all have eternal life. It is a different way than the way of the world. It is not about you, it is about others. It is the recognition that he is in all things, above all things, using all things to reach them, to help them, to save them, the way he saved you. Love your city, join his mission. That your neighbor would know, that your coworker would confess, that every single one around you would see that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he is at work in your city.
We are grateful for the blessings that have been granted to our community by the Lord. A woman in our community faced great difficulties of being evicted for unpaid renter and being left by her husband to raise her kids on her own. Despite these great difficulties, we continue supporting her with our visitor and prayers. And during our most current visitor, we were delighted to discover that the landlord had provided her with a job of being a a caretaker and also gave her a house at no cost. One exciting moment we had this year was actually through our Velocity program. There was one family in particular that um, the team, we hadn't had much success um, in visiting them in their home. Every time we'd go, they weren't there. So on the way, we prayed and we asked the Lord, um, if it's your will that we talk to them today, that we meet them, um, let them be there um, and let us have a great conversation. Well, we pull into the driveway and we meet our student's older brother, um, who was actually just about to leave. And we were able to share all of the great things about um, our Velocity Mentor um, and just tell them how thankful we were that they were in the program over the years um, and invited them to Super Saturday. And they both had kind of said that their families usually don't go out and do much, but they'll try to be there. Um, well, lo and behold, um, their mom um, ended up coming to Super Saturday um, and she connected and weaved in with the families there and with the team. And then a couple of weeks later, they had a little moment of crisis um, with their family. And she reached out to our Velocity team who were really woven in to support their family and their student in Velocity to provide help after that moment of crisis. Um, and so we were thankful that the Lord really opened the door, that he set things up um, and sets things up like Velocity and Super Saturdays to be able to go deeper with families and to build real relationships. So Anna and Jamie are going to come up and we're going to spend the rest of today really unpacking Love Your City and all the different ways that it can take place in your city. So we'll hear from them now. Uh, first of all, let's just all take a breath. <laughs> <It's>, uh, I want <clears throat> to, in a way, apologize to you. The conference has shifted so much this year, not to just be aimed at these local teams across the world with some churches coming, to be content that is really for all of us together. And so I think uh, I, we have to blame <clears throat> me for this. I think we've been galloping a little bit with some of the content We'll do, we'll do better at, at slowing down together and putting handles on things so that we can participate all together. It's just good hospitality for you. And as leaders come in that are strong, strong leaders like you, uh, it honors your place and the work that God's doing in you. So I, I apologize that we've been galloping and uh, just everybody breathe, take a deep breath. And then, um, I'm just going to pray for us, and then we'll, we'll get started. It's going to be fun today, and, and I believe God's going to help us. So, Jesus, we, we are grateful for each person here. Uh, we're grateful for every person. It's amazing to look at what you've done in every human life, and even when they're really involved in sinister, sinister stuff, it's still amazing all that you formed in them. And so, Lord, um, this process of redemption that we're all in, of restoration, of coming back to you is a beautiful one. And we're excited to get to be a part of it. Uh, it's your story though, it's your story. And so what we really honor today in each person in this room is your life in each person, the experiences that you have embedded within each life, the ways that you have given them gifts and capacity. And what we ask you for is that you would weave us together into being a community of giftedness, of discernment, or that we'd be more together than we could be separately. We pray for those who will come in the future. We pray, first of all, that we'll be ready for them and, and teach us this year, help us to slow down and to make room. But then, Lord, we pray for those who will come in, the things that they'll add, the glimpses that they will give, the stories that they'll tell. So we, we just pray, Lord, that you would get us ready for, for that. We do pray also for each person here. They're sacrificing time and their lives to be here. 
pray that you would reward them, restore them, uh, uh, compensate for that. You're a rewarder of those who earnestly seek you. And so we, we, we claim that. But I, I also pray that you would just give them a lot of peace. And today, Lord, we need a miracle a little bit. We're going to share some things that are a little bit more practical and even strategic. And for sure, they're going to be things that we're all not fully engaging in. And even some things that the way that we'll present it today, it's not what some of us are called to fully engage. So what we pray today, Lord, is that the principles behind it, the, the things that you have to say in it all, will give all of us a glimpse of what you're calling us into in a deeper way. And that, Lord, you'll help us to love our cities. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so... Uh, I'll say a few things, and Anna will say a few things, and we're just going to go quickly through the parts of something to show you uh, that I don't, I don't want to say what it is. It's Love Your City, but I don't want to say that. Um, but then we're going to end up with two panels this morning. One will be from um, local leaders from across the world who are involved in Love Your City. Then we will give you a bathroom break today. So <laughs> it's wild. We're letting you breathe today and use the restroom. So we're getting better already. <laughs> Crazy. Yes. Uh, and we didn't give you sleep last night, but, you know, we're working on it. It's overrated, Donna says, and you can count on Donna. She's a medical professional. <laughs> Man. Uh, so then uh, we'll have those two panels. You will get a bathroom break between them, so you got that. Um, and then um, we have a, a diagnostic tool for Love Your City that we're releasing today that will be most helpful for the local teams, but we will uh, release that. And then we'll, of course, cover the workshops in the afternoon before we send you out for lunch. We'll just get you thinking about them, and then you go to lunch. So he here's what I would say about Love Your City. Um, love, here's what I would say is when we talk about turning to love your neighbors or turning to care for people, uh, we, we sometimes act like it's such a big deal that we would even think of it. You know, it's kind of like you're focused on yourself, you're focused on yourself, you're focused on yourself, and then you turn to love somebody else, and you go out and you're just like, kind of do it. <laughs> but if you think about it, it it's got to go deeper. And when we were talking about from consumption all the way to consequence, when you get to that place of care where compassion's in your heart and you want to start to learn to love people, you would think the moment you step out into it, you're just changing lives. But no, it's like learning a new language. You step out there and you trip and you stumble and you offend people and um, make your wife mad. Sorry, Kathy. <laughs> um, so this process, once you get to the point where your heart fills with compassion and you step into care, it's, it's a process. It's a school. It's a place where you need to be discipled. And really, churches are schools of care. They're, they're equipping places of care. So this is what we're saying to you today, and it's going to be a little bit mind-blowing. But what you can do in a city for sure begins with just love everybody around you, love in every moment, love and serve, as Kathy says, for sure. But you can actually start to then learn to get good at this. Uh, I don't mean that it would ever rely on you or be your talents, but there are deeper and, and they're deeper and more uh, exponential strategies that you can start to engage in. So one last thing, and then I'll let Anna, you kind of fill in the holes here, but in your job, how many of you at your job are satisfied with just knowing how to use your computer and to clock in at your job? Yeah, I mean, of course there's more. Like you've learned in your job such significant things. There's business models and all sorts of stuff going on and analysis and feedback and change that's happening. So can it be in turning to impact your city? I, I'm excited to have Perimeter Church here this year because I just honestly think you guys do this in ways that are extraordinary. Uh, you have turned to engage your city. Chip, is it like 15 nonprofit organizations that you guys have launched? Is, it, is that a right number? to 50 
that um, it rhymed with 15. Yeah, we partner with, but yeah, I would really say it's more like 20 that we're on an ongoing basis were involved. In. Yeah, the, these guys when they finally get their building or get that land over in Johns Creek, they do things like turn to launch. Um, Camps for kids, and how many is it? Ten thousand kids? Or it's like it's right, five thousand. Right now, it's more like seven or eight after COVID. After COVID, seven or eight, it's just seven or eight thousand kids that <laughs> come to the camp. But what's happening there is that they're not just involved in care, but they're learning deeper strategies and how they can impact their city. And so, if you're going at it from yesterday, where we're just opening our door to know our neighbor meeting Alexis, and all of a sudden you're like, I've got to help 8,000 people. Yes, don't think of it that way. But when we come together and God gives us a different lens and great ideas, innovation and ideas, all of a sudden you're just opening up this campus in Jones Creek and you're taking these amazing people in your church and you're offering a camp and it's changed so many lives. A lot of their pipeline for great young leaders has come through both the camp and really through the staffing of that camp. Um, so these are the kind of ideas that on a day like Love Your City, we would like to present. Now we're gonna present a specific model that the local teams for Boy the Ball use across the world and that we're starting to see churches use. But I wanna say to you, don't get caught up in just that. Let it be an example. And if it stirs for your church or for your group other ideas, go for it. And I know a lot of families, actually, that when they get involved in these sorts of things, like walkthroughs and Love Your City, they just go back and say, I could do this in my neighborhood. So today we're going to go through all the facets of these kind of things. You're going to see glimpses and get perspective. But I'm, I'm hoping that God will speak beneath or above or somewhere around the actual content to just show you greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done in the city. And we're not good at this stuff. We're not made to be good at this stuff alone, but he is great at this stuff. And the Bible is filled of stories of transformation and we just don't give him a chance to, sh to show off in our lives. And so this is what today's about. What would you say before we go into it? I the thing that is occurring to me as Jamie's talking is just like, we're in good company if we think of ourselves as disciples. Because um, if you look at the disciples that walked with Jesus, then uh, there were a lot of moments where they were pretty slow to things and went out and tried it and it didn't work very well and then would have to come back and then Jesus would teach them again and walk with them. So if we look at it that way, it's encouraging because then as we're all learning together and as we go do things and as we're talking about becoming a group of people together that could go out and learn, not just here on a weekend, but throughout the year and then come back and have points during the year where we're gathering and learning, then that's really encouraging. And then, so as we're talking about this, I love love your city in the sense that if, if you think about it very clearly, Jesus went so many times in the gospel where Jesus went, and you see that over and over again. And um, so this is about going. And like Jamie's saying, there's some parts that um, will be specific to, uh, you may identify with certain parts, but that's great. And then we can all learn in those parts. So take what you can. And then there may even be somewhere, I know there's a few people in churches here that are looking at doing something like this. So then that's great because you'll be able to see kind of start to finish. But it's really Jesus going out with the guys, walking through towns and neighborhoods, getting to know people um, with the power of God was, and the Holy Spirit was ministering through them. And then things would happen after that. So. That's great. So Anna, you'll start with the first part of it, right? Great. <laughs> are we showing the video, yeah, the animation? Yeah, it'll come up. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. We'll show you real quick. Some of you have seen the animation about Love Your City, but it's a little more fluid and gives us a, a good glimpse.
That's an old form of that video, but it's got the subtitles, so it's great. Good. <laughs> um, okay, so it starts with the team. And like we were just talking about <clears throat> with the disciples, it's actually a perfect kind of segue. Because uh, think about who was impacted the most in, as it even think about the Gospels and what you know of the disciples and of Jesus, but who was impacted the most? Certainly people who received miraculous healing or different things were impacted, but the people we know the most about in the Gospels were actually the disciples and their stories. We have a mentoring program in schools, which you can hear about in the workshops, but we tell the mentors and we see actually even through data that the ones that's high school kids mentoring middle school kids, the ones that end up being most impacted are the high school kids who are learning to give and to care. And it's, it's like that. So for us, the and for Love Your City, it starts with a team. And so for Boy with the Ball groups, that's um, each country, each city has a team that's meeting basically on a weekly basis that's seeking the Lord together, growing um, around, uh, you know, the five things, the forgotten pieces that's back there in the book. Uh, if, and then um, disciplines around learning to be in community, um, baptism, what it is to follow Jesus, but seeking the Lord on these things, growing, and for a few reasons. One, you can't ask people to grow in something you're not growing in. Um, you can't give what you don't have, but then there's also not integrity. You can't walk into a, a people's lives or a community to say, grow, but then, um, two, we need the team dynamic to grow. Uh, I'm a basketball player, and if I'm playing by myself, I'm great. Um, by the way, I can make all the shots. I can do a lot of things. But if I'm playing with a team and I have defense, all of a sudden, that's a different story. But I see where I really am, and I actually grow versus just doing stuff by myself. And so the team dynamic that you need in pursuing Jesus is positive peer pressure. Um, but you help each other. You learn from each other. You grow together. But the team ends up being very impacted. So you have this team. It, it's interesting, too. We were talking yesterday in one of the workshops about, like, even in churches, you don't need the whole church sometimes. You just need a small group of people that are like that team that's committed to growing and to changing and then to going out. And change starts in small parts and then grows bigger. Um, we need a team that's growing and that's going out. Anything you doubt about that? No, that's right. Uh, for couples that we've seen do this in their neighborhoods, your family is the team. And um, that opportunity to talk before you head out and then to kind of debrief as you come back and um, is really beautiful. Uh, as you start to grow in the Lord as a team, you more and more begin to incarnate the kingdom. Your relationships, as you heard um, Monica say last night, that the people that were coming in, there's something different. Um, and so as you're coming in, there's something different. You're incarnating that. But then there's also, you're demonstrating the kingdom. Mm -hmm. When you're encountering people, you're praying with them, and things are happening that only God could do. And that, that really, really helps differentiate you between just being some nonprofit organization. And finally, then there's an opportunity, of course, to proclaim. So that team comes in doing those things. That's team. Next one. So donors and volunteers, you saw on the, the animation, uh, some who will give, some who will go. In the old days, we didn't try to find anybody who would give. We just got out there. It's, it's inexpensive to do this. What we realized is you're missing opportunity to invite in businesses, marketplace leaders, the whole city. So it's just a story about a little team going into an economically disadvantaged community or a slum instead of being about a whole team serving as a catalyst for marketplace leaders and for couples and families who want to give and for churches um, to be able to give, but then also to be able to go. And I could tell you some stories that blow your mind of the goers in that, like Western Union Foundation. We were building a building in Costa Rica, and we, we thought Auburn University's graduate design program was bringing the money for the materials, and they in fact, we're not. They, they showed up and were ready to build it, and they said, okay, we need to go buy $10,000 of materials. And we were like, okay, great. <laughs> so a lot of us stayed uh, as a part of the construction, and a lot of us had to go out and fundraise. And we showed up to a, an international school in, uh, community service club that afternoon. We just said to the kids, we're in trouble. Of course, all their parents are like leaders of the country. 
So they got on the phone. This girl, Gloria Soho, got on the phone. She talks like this. And she called Western Union Foundation and set up a meeting for us on Friday. And we took Lucy, one of the community members, and we went and sat down. And they gave $12,000. But then that began a relationship with Western Union where they started through their corporate social responsibility sending in all, all of their employees to come and do team building activities that would go into the community. But then we had a Christmas party every year and they started Western Union would bring in the staff to be all there and you'd have 40 to 60 Western Union leaders all there helping us. But I would listen to the HR director turn and say, I know that it's not within my purview to talk about faith today, but I have to tell you what you're gonna touch today is gonna touch your heart beyond what we touch at work and be open, be open today. And then they invite us over to go speak at this um, like international conference of all their, their workers. And the vice president, he introduces us and says, where El Triangulo is, this community used to be my grandparents' field where I would ride BMX bikes across. And these people are my heroes. And he turns to me and says, I want you to tell this, your story. And I said, my story is a faith story. He said, they all need to hear it. Uh, it's just so crazy. If you don't turn to ask people to give, it's not that God needs money. He's, he's not, he hasn't lost his wallet anywhere. It's that if you ask a doctor, well, if you ask a young, okay, now let's do it this way. If you ask a doctor for 10 hours of his time, he will slap you. <laughs> he will say, never. If you ask him then for $10,000, he'll say, okay, that I can do, you know? If you ask a college student for $10,000, he will pass out. <laughs> it's, it's, it's right. But if you ask him for 10 hours of his time where there's a bunch of other single young people, he will be there and buy pizza. So some who will give, some who will go. You take this team that's serving as guides and catalysts, but then you, you make them inviters. When the the spirit and the bride say come when the spirit comes into the church we become inviters and and you're just inviting everybody to go but what's kind of great is you're creating a power encounter an old testament power encounter where you're saying to the whole city show us your worst neighborhood show us the one that you just think nothing can fix show us the one that you're scared of we're going to show you what God can do in this community, and we're going to invite everybody to be a part of it so that when it happens, everyone will see who God is. And that's, that's donors and volunteers. So the next one is walkthroughs. In Spanish, we say caminatas. Yes, um, you heard Monica refer to those also yesterday. So what's great about walkthroughs is it's the team, which I will say the challenge for our teams too isn't just that we're going to do something in a community, but that we're living that, like we talked about yesterday. We're living it in a way where we're caring about neighbors, grocery store clerks, uh, people around us in classrooms. But you do have an opportunity to go together into something, and like Jamie's saying, to impact um, together something beyond just our individual lives. So as the team goes, we pull in the volunteers, and um, we actually break into small teams like you saw on the video. And in a neighborhood or in an area of a neighborhood, some of the slums, like the slum in Kenya that our guys are working in is 400,000 people. So you take an area of it and then let it grow out. But um, take an area and you focus on really getting to know every single young person and their family in that area. So you break up into teams and you actually week after week go around to the same families, getting to know them. And uh, it's, it's walkthroughs, walkthroughs are one of my favorite things, uh, by the way, because um, they're amazing. And I love what it does on a lot of levels, equally for people in the community or our team, but also for volunteers, because when you watch a volunteer come in, uh, they're so nervous because they're gonna do something they've never done before, and it's uncomfortable. And it never gets not uncomfortable. I will go ahead and say that. Like as many times as you're knocking on someone's door, it's uncomfortable. But there's something about stepping into uh, an uncomfortable place. I think it's called liminality. Um, that then uh, you are putting yourself out there. And then in a way, as God meets you, it's life changing for you as you step out. So often volunteers come in our team. But then by the end of it, their faces are glowing because you're putting yourself in a place where, much like the disciples in Jesus, as you go, 
here you're depending on what he's already gone before you and orchestrated uh, to happen. So you go in as little teams, you're getting to know people, and really on two functions. Um, walkthroughs, as you're going, you're deepening relationships, getting to know new people, but you're kind of getting a pulse on what's happening in the community. You're learning constantly of what are young people facing, what are the obstacles that families are facing, and good walkthroughs should lead to things during the week. It's not just about a walkthrough, but it should set up a bunch of stuff during the week where you're taking people to job interviews or immig going to sit with them for six hours at the immigration office and you're getting to know them or you find out that someone's baby passed away the week before and so you're able to go and take them something with some of the people in the community. And you're communicating, you're, you're helping people see the vision of what your, Love Your City is and what people's part is in the community. Because what we're doing is not just coming in saying, hey, we'll, we'll help you. We actually come in and um, place ourselves under the family and say, hey, you guys are the experts here. Uh, we have these things that can help young people. Um, well, do you think that would work in your neighborhood and what's happening for young people here? And in that, and can we be friends? You're developing these relationships. Um, but then you're also saying, hey, what, you're helping them see the vision of this. Like what, imagine what could happen if each young person, each family began to grow and to change and what we could do together in that. Originally, we only let Christians come on walkthroughs. Um, but then just because somebody says they're a Christian doesn't always tell you a lot about them. So <laughs> we started to just open it up. We'd go to universities and say, hey, do you want to make a difference in your community? And man, they'd, they'd come. And so, of course, you need to have those team members so that when you break into groups, you have one leader who, of course, is sensitive to the things of God. But the, the evangelistic opportunity of that team member with those two or three volunteers walking into this crazy adventure is off the charts. Like, um, Jen and I were walking on the west side of Atlanta, and this, these two older ladies were passing us, old, older ladies. and. They, one of them said, well, you need to pray for her. And of course, on the streets, you hear all kinds of really religious stuff, and they're baiting you into acting like religious people. And so I just, I just turned. We had a young Morehouse student with us who I didn't know where he stood in his faith, and it's me and Jen. And so I just said, why do I need to pray for her? And she said, well, her son died. And then you think, well, no, we do need to pray for her. And we went over to her and said, are you okay? And she was crying. It was very sweet. We, we knew those ladies after this, but um, we prayed for her. And as we're walking back, I'm walking next to the Morehouse student. I'm like, uh-oh. I was like, so, <laughs> I never really asked you about where you stand in faith and things like that. How, 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 but you saw kind of what happened. Like, you know, and he said, no, you guys had to pray for her. But he said, um, I'm a pastor's kid. I ran away from home to come here because Morehouse is right next to Spellman. They've got pretty girls. So I'm running from God, but wouldn't you just know it that he sends me into this moment right here? I can't get away from him. So you have a lot of those moments. Um, good job on outreach and walkthroughs. We'll go next to mentoring in small groups. Now, this one's really, really interesting. This is where it all starts to cook. Because I, I think we would actually write discipleship mentoring in small groups. But basically, you have two possible ways this can grow and build. One way is meeting people where they are, not necessarily focused centrally on their faith group development. For instance, in the community, if kids aren't making it through school, they need help to get through school, which by the way, later, if you're going to give them a Bible after they've met Jesus, it sure helps if they can read. So, so if you on, on, let's say on the on a practical, well, I don't want to say practical, but in a, in a community development side, you, if you're seeing the needs that are in, in, involved in that community or, or there in the community, it's starting to create um, either mentoring relationships or small groups that help people do things like um, helping people reach their dreams. Just walking up to somebody and say, what are your dreams? Well, I, you know, I always wanted, I'm, I'm an, I want to be a nursing student. You know, and then five doors down, you walk in and say, well, what do you do for a living? I'm a nurse. And you're like, okay, <laughs> you need to know each other <laughs> right here, you know. But really just walking into a community, when you ask people what are your dreams, it's, it's fascinating. It's a great, great opening question. It actually is a spiritual question. They just don't know it. Um, helping people go further in education. That's a great one in a community 
because who's not for education? You know, your parents care about education. Employers care about an education. So for education, you can do school supplies to help kids uh, not have to drop out. You can do tutoring centers. Um, it can go on and on and on. You can really focus in on things like literacy and other things like that. Uh, and then finally, um, well, not finally. Next, helping people get and grow in great jobs. A lot of people have jobs, but they're not good jobs. Sometimes in a community, you help somebody get a job, and you say, how did it go this week? They say, ah, I didn't go two days this week. Like, okay, we got to talk, because if we're going to fight to get you a job, you got to learn how to keep it. Um, and then finally, building flourishing families. Great marriages in a community is where it's all at. When a marriage isn't happy, people make dumb decisions. So that's the practical side, but I will say, uh, Dr. Karcher talks about instrumental relationships. They're goal-focused. I would say that as you go into somebody's goals that are even practical, you have earned the right through friendship to begin to have spiritual conversations all the time. But then on the other side, as you start to get to those spiritual conversations, you can start discipleship relationships in small groups. And I, I would say there's four things that we just say to, to people that do this kind of stuff is number one, teaching them to call on the Lord. It sounds so simple. But when somebody's facing a really hard moment, just turning and saying, once you've earned the right to really know them, hey, I went through this, 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 and this is what God did for me and Kathy. Let's just, let's turn to the Lord and ask him for help. And um, it's, it's the next week you start to hear stories. Number two, helping them learn to hear and obey God's voice it is so key for a family to be able to learn and hear and obey God's voice. But then also learning them helping them learn to know and follow God's ways. Because there's not only what he's saying in this moment, but what, there's what he's already said to them, and then what's already in scripture, helping them learn both of those, how to be sensitive to what he's saying and how to live out what he's already said. Really key. And then finally, um, this is interesting, but helping them identify and eliminate all the rivals to Jesus that are in their hearts and lives. When you walk with families in slums, you see the issues, these things that they are giving allegiance to, uh, paying on credit. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not always um, a statue or something. It's, it's very often just things that they are turning to that they, they don't need to. So mentoring in small groups start to populate all across the community. Discipleship starts to spread. People's hearts start to be reached. And the, the tipping point isn't 51% or 60. It's really, a, it's just, Honestly, it's around 20%. Once that starts to happen in a community, a, a wave starts to go across the community. Miracles starts to happen and change. Which leads to the last part, <clears throat> community transfer, transformation. You heard in Monica's story last night, too, what Jamie's talking about, a, the getting involved in the girls' small group was one of her first entry points and then just really began to grow. Um, but as... Uh, mentoring and small groups, discipleship and small groups are happening. One of the things that we're looking for are leaders or um, people where you start to see that the spirit of the Lord is in them and they're hungry to grow and uh, to learn these things. And so what you start watching happen is that uh, it's kind of, we talk about our team sometimes being a portable community that's coming into a community and you're and you heard that in what she said yesterday too, you're showing people you're living in a way that then is, is different and gives hope and vision for that. But then what happens in a lot of the discipleship in small groups is then you're replicating it. So what ends up happening in a community is you end up with a lot of these development, discipleship, relationships and groups that are uh, communities and then a community that are growing and learning to live around you know, the things Jamie was just talking about, how to know Jesus, how to follow him, how to um, be part of a, a local church community and grow in these things. And, um, and then where you start watching that a lot of the leaders that you're seeing rise and you're developing for that are leading the efforts within that same community. Um, and they're beginning to be the ones that are leading to a point where you're actually able to then scale into other communities you, with them as well that are helping, but then um, into, or if it's like a slum like our guys in Kenya, to other parts of the slum and to other other communities. But do you also start to see really measurable differences in the community? And some are intangible and some are tangible. So some intangible ones, for example, like we saw in Costa Rica 
when we first went into the, the squatter settlement that Monica was talking about yesterday, the women wouldn't look at you. So if you were walking, they would keep their heads down. And even if you said hi, they wouldn't look at you. There was so much happening um, in them. And a lot of the negative voices she was talking about, after a few years of being very present, it was a very different story. You'd walk through, women's heads were up, they were looking at you. There was just like the sense in the community was, was entirely different. We, there was also, as we would go in the first years, uh, there was a lot of fear. There were three rival gangs that ran this particular community, and so people would not come out of their houses sometimes just because of fear or other things. But as there was, um, uh, I would say, like the presence of God through people in the community, then it created um, a place. I kind of think about it sometimes, you know, at the end of Lion King, at the end of the movie where... Um, the green and the light rolls over again over all the dead. That's how it feels um, sometimes being in a community that the more you're present and caring and the more the presence of God is, the more light there is. And the less you're present, by the way, then the darkness is present. And so, um, but it's, it, and you see that very tangibly. Um, the power encounter Jamie's talking about in that same community, the gangs ended up uh, leaving, and you can ask us how that happened, but it was pretty dramatic, and some was some infighting between themselves, but they ended up clearing out. God really cleared them out, and um, it enabled a lot of other groups to also come in and do things, but then you started to see an education pipeline created as well, and so where kids hadn't been making it past third grade, all of a sudden they were making it to sixth grade, and then on into high school, and then with the partnership with Western Union, began to um, be scholarshiped into college, and then get jobs into Western Union and other multinationals. So you just watched a lot of the development happen across the community. So we're going to call up the first panel. The thing that I would say to you guys is when you hear all that, you're like, I have to do all that? Of course you couldn't. Um, but what's more interesting is when you hear all that, most all of you in this room have participated in that to one extent. You've gone on a Saturday, or you've given some money, or you've been team members, or you've been at church. Perimeter Church, these guys, or some of these guys have never been to the Sarah Court community yet. We're going tomorrow, so you guys could come. Um, but these guys, their whole church is always at the Christmas fiesta that we have, and there's just, it, you guys all there. Um, but there's also giving that's happened and a lot of different things that you guys have done to invest in that. So what's sort of interesting is rather than thinking, I have to do all that, the whole idea of it is, no, you don't. What you're doing is you're creating a place where all of us together get to participate in what God will do. So that's kind of exciting, and I'll give it to you. Great. So if you are on the panel, will you come up? So that's Monica and Defini and Moses and Maria. I'll introduce them as they're coming up, and then we just have a couple questions. And then after that, guess what? You can go to the bathroom. So hang on. Uh, all right, so... Come on over, Moni. All right, so we have Moses as our team leader in Kenya. Uh, Maria leads Love Your City here in Norcross, which many of you have participated in. Monica, as you know, is the country director in Costa Rica and a fine assistant country director in Nigeria. So I have two quick questions for you guys. Um, but the first one is, um, how has Love Your City helped you grow as a leader? Yeah, and you can, there you go. Um, Love Your City has helped me personally, just like some of you who were here last night and um, heard my story. One thing it has helped me to see is that uh, there is so much that can happen when we are able to just discover that we have all it takes. And instead of thinking about what we need to be able to reach out to other people, we just have to reach within to see what we already have that God has given to us. And um, as I began with uh, my team in Nigeria to just go into the community to love and care for young people, something great started happening within me. And um, it's amazing that I can't fully describe it, but that has been great and I have grown a lot. That's part of the reason why you see what you see in me right now. Yeah. Uh, 
Ok, este, he crecido bastante en lo que significa más tu ciudad. I've grown a lot in what is Love Your City. Y una de las cosas es que hace cinco años tal vez no hubiera podido estar al frente de tantas personas. One clear example is that five years ago I wouldn't be able to do this in front of people. Pero he aprendido también en cómo cuando me levanto todos los días. I've learned too that when I get up every day. Preguntarle a Dios que hacia dónde nos vas a llevar el día de hoy. What, where will he take us today? Porque todos los días son diferentes. Because every day is different. Y son días nuevos para aprender más y más. And each day is a new day to learn more and more. Y el Espíritu Santo no se va a mover igual ayer como hoy. And this Holy Spirit doesn't do the exact same thing he did yesterday that he'll do today. Entonces es cómo estar alerta para poder seguir al Espíritu Santo. So how do we be alert to be able to follow the Holy Spirit? Y he aprendido también que no solamente es en la comunidad. And I've learned it's not just what's happening in the community. Sino es todas las personas que están alrededor de esta. But it's all the people that are around that as well. Gracias, Mami. Um, I grew in so many ways as a leader, uh, being a part of Love Your City. Uh, I think to start with, I moved here six, year, six years ago from Brazil, and I didn't speak any English when I started doing Love Your City. So there's that. <laughs> I am able to communicate with people in the United States now. Um, but then you have like bigger ways, like being a part of a team, especially um, uh, growing within the local team. It, it's it makes you grow like crazy if you it, I think a rule for anybody who wants to be a part of a, a boy with the ball team is if you don't want to grow don't don't join because you're gonna grow <laughs> so uh, that's a big piece um, people are gonna um, hold hold you accountable to what the Lord is saying and hold you accountable to hear the Lord's voice and that's a big deal uh, through love your city I also met the Lord so That's a big piece of being a, a, a leader, I think. Um, but then it put me in situations where I had to, uh, I had to ask the Holy Spirit, where do I go now? Uh, what do I do now? Uh, and I had to face situations that were uncomfortable. I'm an introvert, so I had to come outside of my introvert shell and like learn to relate to people and care for people. Um, so there's... A, I could keep going, but I'm going to stop right here. <laughs> Maria also learned Spanish in the community. So not only English, but also speaks Spanish from that. Uh, for me, I said that uh, Love Your City has uh, made me to be thankful for what the Lord has blessed me with. Because normally when we walk uh, in the neighborhood and you knock on those doors and you meet people who are uh, facing different challenges, maybe somebody's sick, maybe somebody has gone for days without food, or maybe ju just different challenges that people are going through the community. And then you reflect the same with your life, and you see how how, how great the Lord the Lord has blessed you. So normally it has um, made me to be so thankful for every little thing that the Lord has blessed me with. Another thing, uh, through Love Your City, I've learned to be patient because it takes time for God to work through somebody's somebody's life and all that. Uh, like uh, the guys and the group that we work with at Kawangware, like uh, the slum that that uh, we we normally work in. Sometimes there are so many goals that they have, but then it takes time. And uh, when you wait and you see the result, then it makes you to be patient on the Lord. Because sometimes for us, you want things to be like fast. You want the result to be fast. But then for the Lord, you, you, you come to understand that the Lord works in different ways. Sometimes he does, this, he does them like so fast, and sometimes it takes time for him to work through our life. That's great. Thank you, guys. Okay, second question I'm going to ask you to answer succinctly. Uh, so briefly, but what are young people facing in your community and how does Love Your City help? So they're kind of a tied question. Anyone, if you're ready, can answer. Yeah. I'll say that young people in uh, Nigeria generally and then even in communities where we work are facing a lot of different kinds of things and um, One of them is poverty. Um, another is identity crisis. And uh, we have hopelessness. Just um, 
purposelessness as far as life is concerned because they wake up every day not knowing what the day is going to be like and they just live through it however it is. And um, a bunch of other things like sexuality and a whole lot of others. So um, Love Your City has helped really in many ways because Love Your City brings hope. Love Your City helps uh, young people to see that there is purpose to life. And um, as we walk through um, communities where we are reaching young people, we see that as we draw them into mentoring relationship where they are equipped and um, where their lives begin to change and growth begins to happen. Some of them are able to even graduate from school and or gain admission into college. And uh, some of them who thought they wouldn't amount to anything in life are beginning to really get to a place in life they never dreamed they would be able to get to. So Love Your City really has been a panacea to the major problems young people face in our community. Thank you, Fanny. Um, in Costa Rica. In Costa Rica. Eh, también hay pobreza. There's also poverty. Eh, también delincuencia y drogas. There's also delinquency and drugs. Pero son personas que que abren sus corazones para nosotros poder ser amigos de ellos. But there are also people who open their hearts so we can be friends with them. Al principio, como decía Ana, muchas de las puertas eran, estaban cerradas. Uh, at the beginning, a lot of doors were closed. Pero con el pasar del tiempo y sin rendirnos. But as time passed and without giving up. Ahora muchas de las familias nos invitan a pasar a sus casas. Now many people just invite us into their houses. A veces nos invitan a comer con ellos. They invite us to come eat with them. Y también abren sus corazones y comparten el dolor que están pasando. And they also open their hearts and share what's happening and the pain that they're going through. Y eso nos permite a nosotros orar por ellos. And this allows us to pray with them. Y también es algo que no queda ahí. And it doesn't just stop there. Sino como nosotros podemos seguir las siguientes semanas trabajando con ellos. But also leads into uh, the following weeks of being with them and walking with them. Gracias, Moni. Um, here in Gwinnett County and Sarah Court, we have a mostly Central American population, which means that the young people are facing having to navigate the U.S. school system, but then also have to learn English and Spanish at the same time. Um, and then in the meantime, parents are having to work really hard. Uh, sometimes the whole day they're out. So then that creates a very vulnerable situation for young people where they're um, they're not only having to learn all these things, so then they're behind in school, it's not their fault, but they're behind in school. Uh, but then also they're sometimes out the whole day without their parents at home. So uh, there's a chance that they could choose um, negative things in the meantime while, while they're facing all these things. But what Love Your City does is, um, like Anna was saying, it brings that light from like the Lion King. And it really creates a positive gang type of thing, like Jamie always talks about, where if you're if a young person is uh, doesn't have their parents home because their parents have to work really hard all day, then might as well join a positive gang, right? Join us and like help us with tutoring and things like that, or be a tutoring. And then there's the practical help part of things where uh, tutoring center helps them catch up academically. We've had some of our kids from the tutoring center that have been there for a while. Uh, speak, be class speakers, win awards of the best students in their class when uh, that would not be possible in the past. Um, but then just uh, just the fact that volunteers come every week and spend time with young people really changes their lives. Uh, it really shows that people care for uh, care about them and care about their future. The other thing is vision for their future. A lot of some of them were born in the U.S. Some of them weren't. Uh, so navigating what is going, what does going to college look like? Or do I go straight to work? Uh, what does my future look like? What are my options? Uh, so that's another thing that young people face, and then we address that by mentoring relationships and, and talking about career and stuff. That's great, Maria. You can tell she likes it. <laughs> okay, I'd say that there's a lot of uh, stuff that uh, young people face uh, way back in Kenya, because uh, most of the young people that you work with come from uh, maybe the 
let me call it like the slums. But maybe just to make it, uh, I'd say like, like a, a number of them is because uh, they have lost hope and uh, they, cannot be, they cannot be able to find their purpose and all that because of the challenges that they face on a day-to-day they, they, they day -day basis. And that's why like, uh, for us, what you do in Kenya, we try to, to work with them and uh, also reach them within uh, the places that they are based. Because normally when you wait for them to come, that isn't like a, a real friendship. But what we do, we have to go to their locality. If uh, they're, they're in a certain slum, maybe like a certain group, we, we go there, we meet them, and uh, we just chat with them and uh, show them friendship, friendship and love and, and all of that one. Through that one, I've seen a, a lot of things happening through the power of God. We have seen uh, a number of kids who are dropped out of school being, uh, uh, being able to graduate. And uh, some of them now are uh, planning to, to look for jobs and all of that. We have seen kids who had already, like, uh, there were already a number of kids who are like uh, broken families because maybe they were addicted to drugs and all that, and then there was a separation between them and their families. But uh, through that, loving them and uh, showing them that this is possible, we have seen their families being able to welcome them back. Though it's not like all of them, but it's, it's a process whereby we normally pray that uh, maybe in time uh, the kids and their families will be able to, to, re to, to reunite. Also, there are uh, uh, girls that you work with, girls who are like in a juvenile prison, whereby maybe they did something bad and then they were sent to those facilities. For them, what you do, it's just going there to pray with them, to love them, and uh, just to let the Spirit of God work. But uh, most of the things, you just let God to do it on, on his own way. Thank you, guys. Um, so, and just <clears throat> excuse me, in just a second, uh, we'll go. I want to highlight two things. It's, it's great listening that you can touch some of the commonalities that are happening for young people across the world, even in the midst of different cultures, but hope, hopelessness, hope is a big one, and then um, future and some of that. But then Moses just uh, hit a really important point. The part of the wonderful part about having outreach teams that are going is that you're getting to people that wouldn't normally make it to places like um, to help. So we use the metaphor a lot of times with our teams, like a fire truck, if a house is on fire, they don't ask the house to come to the fire station. <laughs> they send the trucks out to, the, to where the fire is. And so thinking about the strategic outreach teams like that, we're sending people out to where they need help. So thank you guys. Bathroom break, see you back in 10 minutes for the next panel.
We're going to start to gather back, starting about 30 seconds early, so that you guys can be on time. It's an easy win. I want to just say that the Perimeter Church participants, they are in their chairs, and a lot of the rest of you guys, it's not a, it, it's not a competition. But it, you, well, it's a smaller sanctuary. For you guys, this is easy. You're usually having to run. Come, come on in as you get a chance. People are coming in. Don't, don't worry. It'll take, a, take us a minute. Great job to the panel this morning. Your answers were, she, she was asking you to be succinct, but you were so succinct. It was very beautiful. Uh, and really, really poignant. Everything that you were saying was, was very impactful, so thank you. It's a gift to have people who are giving hours and hours and years and years of their lives to do something, and then they're able to distill it and just hand it to you. That's a gift. So we're, we're going to keep that rolling. Last year, one of the things we did at this conference is we just mentioned that there's something you see in the New Testament that you don't see as much today which is that they did have the local houses, the local churches that were meeting in houses. But they also had these strategic outreach teams. Paul was one of them. Uh, Barnabas was with them for a while, of course. Um, you know, Jesus' group themselves, they were that. And so the group that was just up here, they were kind of a modern reflection of those teams that maybe can go to places that a whole church can't get to to help a church get in there. But now we'd like to turn our attention to churches. And so um, we have uh, three great leaders. I'm gonna ask the panelists to come up and grab a seat and then I will introduce you guys. Of course, we have uh, Pastor Chris Hyatt. Chris, uh, most of you know, is the best man at my wedding. And in fact, the guy who officiated is over there. There's uh, Dr. John Stanko, there he is. Um, but um, I'm gonna give this to you, Chris. So Chris is the pastor here at Covenant Life Church. Um, and is a, thank you, a big part of us being hosted, sorry, John's making comments. Uh, he's a big, big part of, of this happening this week, but he's a big, big part of our entire team. And he's in an unusual situation to be able to influence not only Love Your City here in this city, but through his love and care and this church's love and care for the global team. Also, it happening around the world, so glad to have him. Uh, we have Esteban here today who's part of Nueva Esperanza. In, um, it's a church in Costa Rica that's a historic church. We have a good friend, Hugo Salaya, that we've known for so many years. And Esteban's been walking with him, Esteban and his wife, Andrea. They have beautiful children at home. But um, Esteban's a, he's in the marketplace, but he's also a, a more and more a, both an elder and a central leader in the church there. And then he's part of the Boy of the Ball team there. So... Uh, the Ortiz family, they're a great couple. It's, it's amazing to have them here. Andrea um, grew up as a volunteer in a lot of these things, so it's wonderful uh, to have Esteban here. And then Chip Sweeney, uh, glad to have Chip here. Um, Chip and Perimeter, we're, I, it's going to sound like we're over-honoring you, but for, for, Chris and, uh, for Chris and for our elders, it's so wonderful to have a church in the city that we esteem and admire in, in a long obedience in the same direction of learning to impact your city. And what I would say about Perimeter and under Chip's leadership and, and also the other leaders there is that they're very strategic. They, they make their punches count and they're very collaborative. And um, uh, Chip wrote a great book. It's a, a New Kind of Big I have uh, back in the office. But he's lived it out. He was a part of really um, founding the community outreach department or the, that, uh, that became a key part of their church that continues on today. And we've got some of you guys from there. Um, and then Chip is also, of course, involved in other things. So here's, here's what we're going to say. Um, we're just going to go through some questions. And I'll start with you, Chris, and then we'll just pass the mic. Um, but as church leaders, leading churches out of a sanctuary, out into caring for communities, is not the easiest sell, um, you know. Um, yet, you guys have done that. Why has it been a focus for you? And why, why have you done it? <laughs> yes, why did I do it? Uh, 
You know, I, I was telling the small group yesterday that yesterday celebrates my ninth anniversary as this lead pastor of the church here. And I, thank you. I was looking for some applause. Thank you. I see who's not clapping right now. And, um, and I knew that coming in that our church was a really incredible, family-oriented, Bible-believing church. My father-in-law had pastored it for 27 years done a great job of establishing a loving community. This would be a community that when someone would move, the whole church would be out there to help them move. And so they were very close-knit. We have people that are here even this morning that have been here for not years, but decades. I mean, it's, it's got a long history. It's got a good solid base in the word and a, certainly a move of the spirit. Uh, but the thing that he knew and that I knew was that we would have to turn outward that we had done a good job of being a close-knit family. But there was a world, there was a community, there was a city that needed what we had. And we know that up here, but we don't know that down here. We don't know it with our feet. And so we just knew that we were going to have, we knew we weren't any good at it. We were going to have to turn outward. And that the Lord is a sending God. He sent the Jesus, they sent the Spirit, they sent the church, and the church is about, you come to us, that whole firehouse, burning house thing. They, they, we were expecting them to come in here, and God was saying, you got to get out there. And our friend Dal Robinson used to say, the Holy Spirit has bust outside the walls, and he's out there, and you're all busy in here. And so we knew that we had to do some intentional things and begin shifting. It's kind of like turning a ship. You don't just turn it on a dime. It takes some time, some deliberation, some intentionality, but we knew we had to turn outward and we were going to need help. And honestly, that's where Love Your City has been so helpful to us because it's one pathway to get out of the church walls and to do what God has called us to do. So uh, I, I did it because uh, that's what the command is, to go and not to, not to attend, not to sit in a pew, but to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good, Esteban. Same question uh, for you. I would think that uh, we probably right now are in the place what Chris was nine years ago, right? That uh, We are very aware of that we have to do that, but we aren't exactly as a church doing that. And that's the challenge for us. And uh, why are we trying to do it? And glad to he have here Monica and Javi, and they are a part of the church as well. Uh, it's because we know that that brings new life to the church. We know that we have to do that in order to bring uh, the life of the spirit of God within us, because as uh, Anna, well, everyone was saying that, that, that once you go and knock on a door or start a conversation with a young person, you are very aware that you need the Holy Ghost to do that. Yes. I'm, I, there's some things in church that you can say, and you know, and the longer you spend in church, you know that there's some like, uh, very common Christian triggers that you can pull and people are going to respond, right? And we can all pretend that they're not there, but we all know that. We Amen. Do it. Yeah, right? Amen. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> but when you have a conversation in a city or with a kid and they, they don't know church uh, language, and uh, so you have to depend on the Holy Spirit. And what that does is that we have found that that brings life to the church because all of, the, all of the sudden you have people in the church that are like Monica was saying, getting up every day saying, what are you doing, Lord? What, what are you telling me to do today? And how can I hear the Holy Spirit today? So we are not doing it as, as, as we as, as a church would want. I'm, I, I think we're on the path. And, and I'm hope, um, hopeful for that to happen increasingly in our church. And I think the main reason why is because, uh, as Chris was saying, number one, that, that is our job as, as a church. It's not to, to 
make uh, very nice Sunday services, but to go and spread the gospel everywhere, and especially in the community where we are in. And second is because we know, uh, I know as part of the leadership in the church that is going to bring new life to the church. It's going to feel different when we're together if we are all doing what God has called us to do. Thank you. <clears throat> so first I want to give a shout out to Jamie and Chris because I know um, you were saying that you've learned from us, but I want to say that I and we have learned from you, from both of you. And, and what even touches my heart the most is that we're friends and that you have cared for me in various ways that have been such an encouragement. So thank you. We learned from you. Um, so I think the main reason we do is because of Jesus. <laughs> I know that sounds cliche, but right, his life and his heart um, exudes this, that uh, he constantly was drawn to the downtrodden, poor, the oppressed, the orphan, the widow, Right? He calls the disciples in the 72. He sends them out to proclaim the kingdom and to heal. And so we do it because of who he is, what he's done in our lives, and how he lived. And I'll say that we as a church were at the same point that your churches were 21 years ago. So perimeter, real quick, 46 years old this summer. The first 25 years... We were written up as being successful. We were a large church, but quite frankly, we had no strategic efforts in the community outside the four walls. Globally, yes, but nothing locally. And uh, my heart is student ministry, and um, we began this through students. Um, students led the charge for us as a church, but. We say that while we may have been strong in the head, good theology, good doctrine, fairly strong in the heart, gospel, evangelical, uh, we were very weak in the hand. So we've been in a journey over these last 20 years to integrate the head, the heart, and the hand. That's good. Let's keep it with you, okay? and then we'll go back down. So th this would be just for you guys to think about what are some of the benefits of what you've seen? And you've already alluded to them, but just thinking from doing this, what have been some of the benefits? And then, you know, what are a few victories, no matter at what level, even just early signs or what are a few victories that are important to you? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think it's changed us as a church. I, I mean, it literally has changed as a church. We are a much healthier church because we are giving ourselves away, not just globally, but also locally. Um, and I tell you, as I think about stories, I want to go back to students, because it really started that way with middle school and high school students. And I think about how cool it is even with Sarah Court, where Perimeter's involved now, and that has been a lot of, or some at least, of our student ministry. And I want to think about, I think this is right, Alexander Byman, who really came up through our student ministry and then became really involved with Boy With a Ball. I don't know if it was Sarah Court or somewhere else. It was there. Yeah. And so I think, wow, you know, he's just one of many of our uh, folks' lives who've been radically impacted and now are ambassadors for the king. And he continues to do it in his college and... Um, so to me, that's happened over and over and over for us again as a church and has been beautiful. That's great. Okay, so Stefan, same question. What are some of the benefits that you've seen? You talked about the new life a little bit, but then also um, what are just one or two stories for you? It could be personal or for the church that, that you have so far. Uh, personally, I, I think it's, it was to be able to be in touch with real life. <laughs> I don't know, like, I, I don't know how to say that in, in English. I'm, excuse me. Uh, but I'm trying to translate, and it's not that, not that easy. But, Tranquilo. Um, uh, I, I don't work um, in an outside office. I work from home. And then I was on church and in my home, in my home office. So, uh, 
my circle of influence of all Christians, right? So uh, when I get in, Don Jose asked us to be involved with uh, Boy With A Ball, for me, it was like a shock of reality. This is what happens <laughs> outside the church, uh, the, the walls of the church. And I've been absolutely disconnected to this. And I'm, so for me, that was, uh, in, it, it has been like, um, still is, uh, like, I don't know, like a ground, go get me back to the ground, right? Then uh, one of the benefits for our church particularly because we don't have like a structure for reaching out the community yet. Um, Love Your City provides that. And there's uh, great leaders, young leaders in in our church that uh, have been able to use their gifts in the community and it's not been through the church because the church was focused on like the Sunday services, but it's, it has been through Love the City, Love Your City. And, and they have been doing an amazing job. And now some of those leaders, specifically one of uh, that couple, they um, started a youth group in our church. We hadn't, haven't had a youth group in like three, four years. Literally, there was one uh, girl, and they started that, and now there's like 25 uh, young guys from that community, almost everybody. And we can say that that that's had been like uh, their work with the youth in the uh, Los Cuadros is like, so you always say it's like the, like the field, right? So. I, I think that's definitely the, one of the benefits that we have seen of doing that in, in implementing that in the church. And now we are in a different position to bring this up to the elders. Like, this is what happened. This is, this is what can happen if we start taking action and start like, like to build a structure intentionally to go and reach out the community. So. That's definitely yeah, that's, it's great. Benefit. We say in Spanish, la cancha, but it's the playing field. It's a playing field where you can learn in los cuadros and then go do it in your church. And it is interesting. When you're accomplishing change in an organization, it is a negotiation. It, change takes time. And you're, you have leverage chips of where God does something and it convinces people and they try. So I appreciate you explaining that. So the word benefit is interesting because I think most churches are looking for ways to benefit their church and not benefit the community. Um, Chip talks about the verse in Jeremiah where it talks about seeking the welfare of the city, where God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah to those that were in exile to, to plant gardens and vineyards and marry and to seek the welfare of the city. And I think most churches are looking to seek the welfare of their church. And I think that's where you miss it, right there. Uh, honestly, I think what helps with our focus is that it's not about our church getting bigger. I think that's a side benefit, but that is not the focus. The focus is loving our neighbor. It's loving the neighborhood. It's loving the city, and it's benefiting them. And I think that not only is exciting for how the Lord will get involved in that, because he likes it when we don't do it for ourselves. I mean, I think he teaches stuff like that. Um, he is looking for those who are willing to lose their life. And he said, if you lose it, you actually get life. But if you seek to build your church, you're going to lose it. Well, that's not exactly what he said, but something similar. And so I think that's got to be the first focus. Who, who are we trying to benefit here? And honestly, we've had volunteers and some are sitting here today that because it was intriguing to them that you were actually doing something that wasn't directly benefiting your church. Because they were skeptical. They were th thinking, I've seen churches before, and they look like they're wanting to be a blessing, but it really feels like they're just trying to get butts in the seat and dollars in the plate. And maybe they didn't say that. That's maybe my words. But the point was is they saw the selflessness of sowing into something 
And that was appealing to them as a volunteer. The Lord started doing something in their lives, too, because of that. And so I just got to say first, it's about how are we benefiting our community and our city? And that's a shift for a lot of pastors and churches. I talk to a lot of pastors. Chip does, too. I'm sure Esteban does, too, that at the core of it, they're really worried about how they're doing as a church. And I just don't know that that's godly. I don't think it's kingdom. I think we need to be concerned about the kingdom and about what he is advancing. And, and there will be a church, there will be benefit to the church. Now, it has benefited us tremendously. One of the ways that we see the benefit is, uh, Jamie mentioned earlier about inviting volunteers and students especially. Students want to make a difference. There is a real high desire among this generation Say whatever you want to about the Gen Z or whatever you want to call them. They have a real earnest desire to make a difference in their community and in the world at large. And that's something some of our generations didn't have. Shame on us. Good for them. They want to make a difference. And so they're kind of appeal. There's an appeal to go along and see how difference can be made. But you know what happens is there's evangelistic opportunities there. They start getting around those that are inspired by the Lord, that are following the Holy Spirit, that are working and they start changing. They start, we allow them to belong before they believe. And a lot of churches require a belief um, ritual of sorts, uh, a certain cadence that they've got to get cleaned up, and then they can go out. But we've done it a little differently. We're like, come on, let's go. And in the process, they, they meet Jesus. And we've seen a lot of people come into our church family because they're meeting Jesus, and they're wanting to be discipled, and then they're wanting to walk into water baptism, and, and they're being filled with the Spirit. And one of them was sitting up here just a minute ago, Maria. That's her journey, her story. She came along. She was volunteering. She was wanting to work on her English because she's from Brazil. Uh, you wouldn't know it, right, to listen to her speak now. Uh, and she learned English really well and met Jesus and then wanted to be discipled. And then she met her husband who did the same thing. He met Jesus through the going, and then they both got married. Jamie and I got to do their wedding recently, and it was just amazing to see what God has done. So how have we benefited? Well, that's been the benefit because people have met Jesus and have become a part of our community, but it's not been about that. It's about being the benefit and a blessing to out there. Well, this is really cool. We didn't plan this, but her husband, Maria's husband, came to volunteer because his family goes to Perimeter and invited him to be a part of Love Your City. So good teaming. That's right. Chris, that's so good. Um, I just want to highlight something you said. You said seats and butts. You used the word butt in church, and I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. We used to, when, when I, I used to be young, uh, sorry, uh, um, <laughs> But when I was younger, we would tell Chris, he would get to speak once a month at the church, and we would give him some word that he had to put in his message, and it was a bet. So it'd be like weenie or something that it would make him, and then he was so good. He was like, meekness is not weakness. Jesus was not a weenie. We were like, did it. You did it, sir. So I had asked him to use the word but, and uh, he beat me again. All right. All right. Let's see, see what the next word is. Um, okay, so we're just going to wrap up here, but I think just as we, as we close and as you're thinking about all of these guys, um, maybe share something that, that you've learned or that's been a key learning for you and, and or something that if you were sharing with people, either as individuals who are considering it or as congregations, um, like what would be something that you might offer them? Uh, well, I kind of already said a little bit, make it about them and not yourself. That's one of the things. The Lord spoke clearly some, some words to me as I came in to help lead our church. One was, you make disciples, I'll build the church. And so that has been a mantra of ours and our leadership. We are about making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. We're not about building our church. The Lord builds the church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We make disciples. That's what we're called to do. And so I would encourage leaders to make that a focal point. Make disciples and see what the Lord will do with that. The other thing that I felt the Lord say to me is, I will give you what you need and take from you what you don't. And we've had both. <laughs> we've had people that could not get in on the, an outward turning and having a team like Boy of All, this local team that's going, that we can partner with. 
they've not seen that vision and and God has moved them on elsewhere and I pray that they can find what God has for them but in the meantime God has sent to us uh, through those meeting Jesus and others that are really impassioned about that vision and so that's been helpful I think James would tell you uh, or one of our elders that uh, a prayer focus and a fasting focus is critical to any of this and so we have annually uh, the month of January where we take the time as a community to pray and fast. And that has been something, you know, we just we skip over the, the most basic of things. But that's the thing that has inspired so much of this change in so many of the people. And, and now we have so many people getting involved in Love Your City, in ESL classes, in, in Velocity. But then not just those things in their own neighborhood or in their businesses or as a medical professional knowing that they're called to minister or as a teacher we have a lot of teachers in our community and they're they are missionaries in their classrooms to those students and to their families and so to add, it's just a catalyst for how that can be uh, spawned into other areas and other people the church i'll stop with that uh this this is going to be hard to to translate from my mind to English, but if I tell you guys, for example, look for this phone, search this phone, you don't have to because you're seeing it right here, right? I can see you, I can tell you point at this phone or phone or look at this. So one of the things that I've been learning and is that I don't know exactly the translation in the uh, English like Bible, but it said like seek the kingdom first and you don't have to seek something you are already seeing like you can point. but when you have to seek for something you have to start seeking where 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 it is it right right so i think that uh for me is like seek the kingdom is where is the kingdom <laughs> right now and it's in the city it's outside and we have to go and seek, and in the conversations, in the uh, walkthrough, in the team meetings, you can, hey, here's the kingdom. Here's something that is happening, and I can jump right in. So uh, for me, that uh, word has been getting like a new meaning in the last couple of weeks, because I've been trying to search where is God doing something? Where is the kingdom? I, I got to go and seek it. And 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 when I found it, I'm, I I want to like ride the, the the wave, right? And most of the, of the times, it's not gonna happen just uh, in our little circle. It's going to we we're gonna have to think outside the box and go outside the church to seek the kingdom. So uh, everything else is he's gonna be in charge of that. I'm just got to seek, right? Yeah, that's great. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. And, you know, John F. Kennedy said that whole thing about the space program. If we don't do it because it's easy, we're going to do it because it's hard. And, and I, think, I think that's the, isn't that sad that we as Christians would be characterized that we can't mobilize our congregations to do what would be uncomfortable, like, that's a that's a bad sign, <laughs> you know. Like followers of Jesus, the, that fruit isn't what we're after. So, uh, what I, I like about what you're saying that it's it's the seeking, it's the process, it's the it's the weekly having to hear him together and grow. And uh, Jesus talking to them around the campfire in the morning, we're gonna go try this, and then at the end of the day, talking about hey, it worked or it didn't work for us, you know. So, right. Yeah, I think we both have shared really good, and I would echo the <clears throat> the spiritual. We call it spiritual multiplication, making disciples who make disciples. But that begins with taking kingdom risks to build relationships, and um, we're beginning to talk more about kind of the being intentional where we live, work, and go. Right? It was what a lot of what Jamie talked about yesterday. But for example, it's the Walgreens. You know, there was a time when my our kids were growing up. I felt like I was at Walgreens like four times a week, you know, getting different things. But I met Norris there, and Norris, uh, I I could just tell that he was a friendly 
guy. He was an employee there. So I would just strike up conversations with Norris. Well, I won't tell you the whole story, but it led to us getting together to have lunches. He ended up giving his life to Christ. He's been in my discipleship group. Um, there's a neighbor, Eric, who right now I am doing with that. He's a big, huge man um, and has a little bit of a church background, but really been turned against it. But it, it's all of us taking kingdom risks to build those relationships and invite others to do the same. One of the things I've learned over many years is that you end up, we, we go with the willing. Not everybody is going to say yes to going with us or to being part of uh, our church or being part of a movement uh, like Unite or Boy With The Ball. But you find out where God's already working and you go with the willing. Um, the second thing I'll say is the harder one to talk about. Um, but maybe if I would say anything that maybe if I'd want you to take away from this or from what I've shared, it would be this. Um, let's not let our ministry become our identity. Now, I know that we all hear that and we say, I, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Jesus is our identity, is my identity. But I believe that a lot of us, numbers of us struggle with this. And I am the foremost. And I'll just, obviously can't get into all this, but I will say that, you know, for over 20 years, I've struggled off and on with mental illness, with anxiety and depression. But it was nothing like what happened to me uh, at the beginning of 2020. This was six weeks before COVID, so it had nothing to do with COVID. But I had a complete collapse. I, I couldn't function. I couldn't make decisions. I couldn't, uh, I would stare at the computer screen. Um, I had to walk into our leadership. I'm part of the senior leadership team. And um, I had to actually take a counselor with me because I didn't know if I could get through it. But I, I, I had shut down. And I won't go into the whole story, but part of it is that the reality was that um, my ministry was a part of my, way too much a part of my identity. So I say all this to encourage us. One is, um, you have not been taken out of the game because you struggle. You know, the Lord rescued me out of my pit because of the team that he placed around me. We talked about team earlier, but my team is people who are extremely close, who know the good, the bad, the ugly about me and can walk with me, encourage me, pray for me, hold me accountable, and some other professionals. And my thought is we all need a team. We're all ambassadors for the king. We all need a team who knows practically everything about us. So my encouragement, and I'm, you know... I. The Lord has rescued me, but it's, it's a daily, it's a weekly, it's a monthly battle for me still. Um, but because of the people the Lord's placed around me, and because of my willingness to be open, um, I continue to walk this journey. Because I know also where we're all going one day when everything will be taken care of, and we will be completely renewed. Well... I think it's easy to see why you would esteem these three leaders. And I, I would say that I'm, we're so glad this year to shift the focus to include churches just as centrally. Because you can see that group that was up here first, these guys need those guys. We, you need the group that's going to get out there. You need that. But that group that was up here so dramatically needs these men and the women also that are with them. Um, we need great churches. We need courageous leaders who are honest and transparent in their process if we're going to make it. So I am so grateful for you. Would you guys share your appreciation? Yeah. I'll hand it over to Jen. Um, 
Um, thank you for, uh, to each of the panelists for being part of uh, today. Uh, this conference has been amazing so far. So yesterday we talked about um, what ministry is and to make sure that we don't think of it as like an institution or something that we do, but it's following the Holy Spirit into what he's doing in each of us. Um, then we saw glimpses of what that looks like in different parts of our lives, whether it's your neighbors, your coworkers, your school. Um, and then that yesterday evening we received ministry. Uh, we can't give what we don't have. And so it's so important to really uh, let Jesus come into every part of our hearts and to change us. Um, and then today we talked about Love Your City. And there are some teams here that implement Love Your City. There are some churches that will take glimpses of Love Your City uh, or individuals that would take glimpses of Love Your City into your life and how uh, we can use that as a platform to reach more young people. And so we created this assessment that helps um, specifically our teams how, to, how do you, um, to know exactly where you are in Love Your City. And so if you're a boy with a ball um, team leader or part of a team, I suggest that you take a picture of this QR code and take it. Um, it's really helpful. If you're not part of a boy with a ball team, I still think you should take a picture of it because it's kind of like a teaching tool. You'll get glimpses even from the questions of what Love Your City is on a deeper scale. So that's our tool. Um, if you have questions about it, you can talk to Jamie or um, any of us. Um, and then I'm about to release you to lunch, which is very exciting. Um, but first, I'm gonna remind us of some workshops um, that will happen. So the first, uh, three options uh, as you come back at 1.30. Uh, it will be uh, Love Your City and Youth Groups, and it's going to be led by Joey, Molly, and me. If you're not there, I may take it personally. Um, <laughs> then we have Love Your City and a church, so we will be able to talk about um, what these guys were talking about in a deeper level. So come with questions. Think about what you're facing. Um, and then Love Your City around the world. So we'll hear from Moses and Emeka and different people uh, about what Love Your City looks like across the world. So those are your three options. Those are the locations up there. Um, if you forgot which workshop you signed up for, uh, you can see Rebecca up in the registration table and she'll let you know uh, where you could go. And then the last three, or sorry, the last four workshops are ESL as an outreach. And so ESL is something that we can start anywhere, in your neighborhood, your church, and how do you use that to reach more young, uh, some more people? And then we have belonging before believing. Uh, that's gonna be led by Jamie. Love your city in schools. And so what does love your city look like uh, in a school setting? Uh, we mentioned velocity earlier, so we might touch on a little bit on that. And then life-changing volunteers, and that'll be led by Nina and me again, so again, I'm looking out for you guys. Um, so my suggestion would be to be back here around 1.20 so you uh, we can go to workshops and then um, have fun. Can I just get your attention really fast? Sorry, a couple of quick things. If you don't remember which dinner missional conversation you signed up for, we have the list in the back, so you can check that. But if you also haven't signed up yet, if you would just go do that really quick, it helps us know how much food to have at each place. So that would be awesome. So as you go to lunch, just glance at it, make sure your, your name's on the list. And then if you are a Boy the Ball team leader, you're going to meet with your teams right now. Thank you guys, see you after lunch. <laughs> 